last week, we talked about decisions based on wisdom, okay? And, and I got so much response that I want to kind of, you know, take it just a little step further because there is a difference between decisions and choices. They're not exactly the same. And I want to make sure that as we dive into today's message that we understand, if I were to, let's just say it this way, if I were to give this message a title, it would be a life full of voices. Because we all got voices around us every single day. There's voices, 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 voices at home, voices at work, voices at church, voices with friends. There's all kinds of voices. Then, then, then there's your voice. And so we are influenced by voices. Can you agree with that? Okay, so we're full of voices, and I want you to understand this. Okay, so based on the voices I'm hearing, based on the voices I'm listening to, I know that I'm going to make decisions based off those voices. But I want to clarify something. If you didn't hear last week's sermon, go on live stream, listen to it. But I want to give you the quick definition of decisions and choices because I think a lot of people think that it's the same thing. It's the same. No, it's not. Let me break this down for you. When we think decisions, with decision, it's more of a process orientation, meaning we are going through analysis and steps to eliminate or cut off options. But have you noticed that? We are an impulsive generation. We don't make decisions based on a process. We make decisions based on desperation many times. I mean, I know I have. I've made some poor decisions, right? Impulsive decisions, right? Not really thought out. But notice that, that when you're making a decision, you're basically you're taking the time to have a process of elimination, most of our decisions don't go through a process of elimination, things that you need to cut out, things that you need to get rid of, things that are not going to work, okay? So that's decisions, and we talked about that last week, okay? Choices. With choice, it's more of a mindset approach, meaning we have a perception of what the right or wrong choice may be. Think about it. It's the, my choice is how I'm going to approach my decision. You guys getting this? Okay, because we're going to talk about choices today. All right, we want to live full of God choices, not me choices, not them choices, not they choices. I want the perfect choice of God. And it's not always perfect either because sometimes we can even use the God card. Well, God told me. Well, and then you realize that once you're in, the, in a multitude of counselors, you realize that, dang, there was really no safety. Right? Like, I made a big boo-boo. Uh, let's use this illustration. Have you ever been in a car with a passenger who thought they were the second driver? Yeah? They're sitting in the car. And uh, I've had this. I'm, I'm, I tend to be that guy a lot. But uh, the passenger, I don't like no one driving me. I, I don't I don't like anyone. Like, hey, man, let's go. Some, okay, but I'm driving. I just don't like no one driving me. I don't like that at all. But I've I've been in situations where... Because I trust me. and I'm trying. <laughs> Hey, actually, on Thanksgiving, man, I spun out of my car three times shoo, 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 like that. And my wife was screaming, ah, and I was like, <laughs> And I'm like, you see? It's all good. <laughs> That's why I'm driving, and you're not. <laughs> okay, going back, to the, going back to this. But have you ever had... Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of Jesus, right? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. That was nasty spun out. But anyways, um, but sometimes you have people that are sitting next to you, people you love, people you care about, hopefully, right? And there's these times where people say a little something like this. Hey, I know a shortcut. But you already know your destination. You already know how to get there. You have MapQuest on the phone. You know where you're going. MapQuest is not going to make a mistake. MapQuest is dialed in. It knows exactly how to get you to your final destination. But there's always that voice of, hey, man, I'm pretty familiar here, man. I grew up in these neck of the woods. You know, this is my neighborhood, whatever. I, I got some shortcuts. And inside of you, you think, like, I know this person is, you know, like direction challenged. You know, like, I know they're not the sharpest director in the pencil box. You know what I'm saying? And 
But just so that you just have some peace of mind, right? Because what are you going to tell them? Like, nah, man, you suck, dude. I mean, you're, you're, you're directionally challenged. I ain't going to listen. You're not going to do that. You're going to be like, okay, well, let me put some confidence. Let me put some trust in this person. Like, okay, well, he says or she said that she knows this area more. And to your big surprise, you take their advice and you end up getting lost confused because then you're like where the heck am I at right and even come to the place of chaos called LA traffic chaos and you're just like man if, if I and you know inside you know what's the worst the worst advice is our own advice that's the worst advice sometimes man I'll tell you you know what there's been times and I'm sure that many you will relate and I do this a lot too but have you ever been in your car and you already have the map on. You know where you're going, right? And, and this spirit of impulse comes in you. You know what that spirit is like? You know, you're like, you know. But then you see, you see like, you see an exit and you're like, man. Because a little bit of traffic builds up. And you're just like, oh, I wonder if this is going to get worse. How bad is this going to get? And you're just like, no, stay the course. Stay the course. Stay the, and you're staying the course. And the exit is just like, man, just like a mile away. And you're like, no, go, go. And then before you know it, you're going, and you're just like, <laughs> and you just, you cross. Man, you, you have like probably like five people flip you off as you're doing the, has anyone ever done that? And you're just, and then you, you, you change, and there was more traffic there than there was there. And you always do this like I have done. You think, what was I thinking? And you start beating yourself up, and then you start feeling angry and upset, and then you're really late. You know why? Because you weren't willing to wait and to take the path, take the map quest wisdom who said, I'll leave it, I'll take it further. I'm that guy that when my kids say, okay, Dad, how long does it say? Well, yeah, it says we'll be there in 30 minutes, but I'm going to shave off five. Don't worry, you're, you'll be good. <laughs> right? And, and why? Because we are naturally impatient people. We're naturally, we want things now. We're impulsive. We make decisions based on desperation. We make decisions based on, I want it now. And we just can't wait. And God is trying to teach his people. God's trying to teach Every single one of us, like, listen, you can, you can go ahead and go for your best, or you can wait for my very best. And, and I think that we can totally understand, all throughout Scripture, how many people were willing to wait and saw the blessing, and how many were not and died in their wilderness or desert. I'll say it this way, too. For some of us that may be, you may be experiencing some desert right now, let me tell you something. There's no fruit in the mountain. Fruit can only be grown in the desert. There ain't no fruit trees on mountains. So just, I want to encourage you just to stay the course. So as you're thinking about um, this message today, I want you to know this. There are four voices that we all hear. There's your voice. That's your opinion. That's your idea. Sometimes we're right. Sometimes we're wrong. Then there's their voice. That's other people's opinions. Other people's ideas. Okay, these are voices we're hearing too. Then there's God's voice. God's voice is his word. It's his scripture. God speaks to us. I always hear people say, God doesn't speak to me. I'm like, open your Bible and trust me, he'll speak to you. He'll speak to you. I think sometimes we're waiting for an audible voice. God says, open my book and you will hear my voice. But then there's Satan's voice. That's another voice we listen to. It's a voice of deceit, it's the voice of lies, it's the voice of confusion, it's the voice of distraction, it's the voice of delay. And we have to understand that these four voices literally project what's inside of us, and then eventually it projects what happens on the outside of our life. And so today I want to just help us understand that we have to begin to understand that there has to be a greater voice than any voice, including mine, and his name is Jesus. Okay, let me give you one quick point. We put our confidence in who we trust. We put our confidence in who we trust. That's where we put our confidence in. And so let's, let's talk about the children of Israel. The children of Israel 
Because I'm about to read a verse. That's why I started with a little bit, little bit of humor. Because this verse that I'm going to read in a little bit is heavy. It'll get people to kind of either shut off or turn on. I have preached a message um, that had a verse similar to the first sentence that we're going to read in a little bit. And let me tell you something. When I read that verse, people were like, ooh. Like they didn't like it. And I'm like, it's all right. You know, because it ain't my church anyways. I'm just a visitor. You know, I didn't care. But this can either make you go, ooh, and shut up, or it can make you be like, I better listen. I better listen to this. And so here you have the children of Israel. They had a leader. You think about this. Moses delivers them out of Egypt. God shows them miracle signs and wonders. God does all kinds of crazy stuff through his servant Moses. He parts the Red Sea. He, he, he feeds them in the wilderness. Man, he's dropping bread from heaven, manna from heaven. He's giving them a pillar of fire when it was cold at night in the desert. He was giving them clouds by day when the heat was scorching. He was constantly, I mean, they are on a path of miracle after miracle after miracle. They're on the path of breakthrough after break. I mean, they're on a God path. Amazing. It was awesome. But the problem was is that they started taking each other's advice. They, they, they forgot that there was a man who had the map quest of God. Notice this. The journey was only supposed to be 14 days. And a 14-day journey turned into what? 40 years, and they never made it to the promise. We have to see this and reflect and say, okay, I'm on a journey right now. Every single one, you're on a journey with God or not. And you have a choice whether or not you're going to fulfill the journey, the promise, but you can't look later and be upset because our life is summed up by the choices we've made. That's just the, that's the reality, whether we like it or not. So, here you have the blind leading the blind. And I think sometimes we have people around us that aren't that good at seeing. And we start taking their advice. And not realizing you're taking the advice of a blind person while you're blind. And how's that going to work for you? So now let's bring it to the verse. Are you ready? All right, don't get mad at me. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1 through 8. I'm talking to me too. This message is from Mauricio Ruiz de la Rosa. That's my family's name. Anyways. Isaiah 30, verse 1 through 8. You ready? Everybody say, whoa. whoa. Yeah, it means like, man, whoa, you better pay attention. Like, he's saying, whoa. Far be it from you. Woe to the rebellious children. That's the sentence I was talking about. Because nobody wants to be identified or put in a category of rebellious. But let me tell you something. We all got a little rebellion in us. Everybody here, including me. All of us got a little rebellion. He says, what are the children? The rebellious children, says the Lord, who take, listen, listen, who take counsel, but not of me. And who devise plans that they may add sin to sin. In other words, who, who devise plans to keep making one bad choice on top of a, another bad choice. Sin to sin. From, from deception to deception. And we just keep going from this to this, and it doesn't get better. Look at this. Who walk to go down to Egypt. Who do what? They do what? They walk to go what? Down, you don't walk to go up. You walk to go down to who? Egypt. Now, what is the definition of Egypt? Egypt means bondage. So we walk down, walk down to bondage. When God's trying to get us to walk up to freedom. Let's keep going. And have not asked my advice. Have you ever done something without asking God for his advice? Like we'll go get everybody else's advice and then we'll tell God or we pull the God card out and say, well, God told me. 
Like, no, you never even presented. You never even brought before God the idea, the opinion that you are planning, right? Because he says they devise plans. They're planning without God. You're just doing your own thing, right? And he says, and they walk down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves. Sometimes we think that we're going to get more strength by doing what we want to do, not realizing that we're foolish because we're basically going back down to bondage, okay? He says, to strengthen themselves in Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the bondage giver. We know that. And to trust in the what? This is good. Stay with me. They put their trust in the what? In the what? In the what? Okay. Do you guys see my shadow? Look around you. Do you guys see shadows on your on your around your chair? You see the okay. They're putting their trust in the shadow. What does the shadow have? Well, let me. What power does the shadow have? What substance does the shadow have? What, what truth does the shadow have? What did David say? Though I walk through the valley of the of, I will what? They're putting their trust in shadow. What color are shadows? Okay. Well, the original meaning to shadow is darkness. They're putting their trust in darkness. They have more faith in shadows than Almighty God. Look at this. Let's keep reading. They put their faith in the shadow of Egypt and the shadow of bondage. He says, therefore the, therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame. And trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. This is hard, isn't it? Don't worry. It's going to get good. Don't worry. Just relax. I'll give you some honey after this. <laughs> For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hannes. They were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them. Come on, right now, the choices you make are either going to benefit you or not benefit you. Or be help or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach will come when we go to the shadow. The burden against the beast of the south. Look at this. Here's what happens when we, when we choose the shadow. When we choose to go to the land of Egypt, he says, now you're entering the land of trouble and anguish. Do you know what the word anguish means? It means severe mental or physical pain or suffering. So if you've ever been in a place where you're constantly suffering, you're in pain, you're in distress, you have anxiety. Let me tell you, the only reason we live there is because we walk down to Egypt. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life to the fullest. Are you with me today? So I'm just laying some foundation. But look at where the land of trouble takes us. It says, from which come the lioness and the lion. Who would like to be in the cage with a lion? I don't think so. I don't care how sweet that little lion is, right? Nobody wants to be in the, even though I've been in the cage with tigers. But that's okay. That's a whole other thing. They fed them before I went in. And you can only do that in Thailand. Look at The land is, is with lions. The land is with a viper. What does a viper do to you? It kills you. Man, you get stung by a viper, you're dead in seconds. And a fiery flying serpent, which if you read in Revelation, the fiery flying serpent is Satan. They will carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people who shall not profit, for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. In other words, man, we tend to put more trust, more confidence in shadows with no substance. That's what the scripture is saying. And not realize that there is like that shadow is not going to help you. That shadow is not going to give you a purpose. 
But when you get in the presence of Almighty God, he gives you purpose. He gives you meaning. He gives you joy. He gives you peace. But isn't it interesting that we sometimes, we choose, which I have done, I rather choose to go ahead and go down the, the slippery slope of depression or anxiety or unbelief. We all live there sometimes. And God's saying, you need to stop. You need to start taking my advice. You need to start coming to my presence because if not, you're going to come back to bondage. Are you hearing me? But here, here it gets even gooder. Look at this. Therefore, look at this. Therefore, God says, therefore, I'm calling this place that you're choosing. I'm calling it Rahab Hem Shabbat. Everybody say that with me. Rahab Shem Shabbat. Say it again. Say it like you mean it now. Say it like you don't like that place. Okay, this is, this. listen, when I read this, I was at home sitting there and just reading through scripture. I kind of knew where I was going. But man, I read this, this Isaiah, I, I, I devoured this for an hour. Okay, for an hour, I just devoured every single verse by verse. And I'm like, what the heck is a Rahab Shem to the Shabbat? And so here's the interesting thing. There's a few meanings to Rahab Shem Shabbat. But the original meaning of this place that God referred to is known as this. It means chaos, confusion, noise, and powerlessness. When we choose to put our trust in the shadow, you come to a place of chaos you come to a place of noise. You come to a place of confusion. You come to a place where you even feel, I am powerless. Have you ever said, I can't change? I've tried to follow Jesus. I've tried to, to be a good person. I've tried to be kind and not rude. I've tried. And so what happens is it's because we're living under the shadow of death. And under the shadow of death, there is no resurrection life. But guess what? You and I get to choose whether or not we want to have life and life more abundantly, or you can choose to keep walking down to the land of Egypt. So as you're reading this verse, as you read who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves, isn't it amazing that sometimes we think that the bad decision is going to bring us strength? Like we know it's not right. We know it's not good. And yet we think that making this decision is going to make me feel better. And who, look at this, and, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. That means that the children of Israel, obviously we know that they started on the right path. They started with God, and they were on the right path following Moses. They were excited because they were delivered, and, and things were wonderful. And, and, and they, they've experienced the presence of God. They've experienced the love of God. They've experienced the compassion of God. They saw God for their own, with their own eyes. They, 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 they had a... A, a, a meaningful relationship with God through Moses, obviously. But check this out. But as they were walking through the wilderness, what happened to them? They got tired of waiting. And they started saying, no, let's go this way. Let's go. Then they're on a mountain. And they're going around the mountain in circles and cir until God's like, enough. And some of us right now, you're going around the mountain in circles and circles with a decision or a choice you need to make. And God's like, enough. Come to my presence. Take advice from me. Take counsel from me. Because I know when you open this word, there is all wisdom already in this Bible. Every single answer you have for the choice you need to make right now is found right here in the Bible. And he leads you to true north. But what happened here? It's amazing because they started out walking in the path of God but then they started turning away from God to the place that God delivered them from called Rahab. I think we've all been there before. Whether it was your faith and now you're a little faithless. Whether it was hope and now you're a little hopeless. Whether you were walking in power and authority and now you feel a little powerless. That's the place called Rahab or Rahab. This, this scripture basically is asking us four questions. Are you ready? Question number one is what this verse is saying. Number one, who will you trust? 
Are you going to trust your opinion or are you going to trust God? Are you going to trust God's plan or are you going to alter your plan? Who will you trust? Are you going to trust God with your family or are you going to take it upon yourself and figure it all out and then only end up making a bigger mess? Second thing he said is who will be your counsel? Listen, the Bible says there is safety in the multitude of counselors. Listen, you can't get around people that like you and that agree with you. You got to get around people that are going to confront your ideas. If you got people that are just agreeing, like, oh, that's a good idea. That's so awesome. Oh, my God, that's so awesome. Yay, you should do that. No, no, no. I want people that confront my ideas. Like, hmm, have you thought about this? It's called examine the decision. Let's, 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 let's make sure we execute and get rid of some of the ideas in this decision so that we have God's perfect will for our life, right? And so he's asking us, who, who will you allow to counsel you? Not everyone qualifies to counsel your life. Not everyone qualifies to counsel me. I love everybody, but not everybody has a voice inside this life. I won't do it. Even though they have good intentions, which I've had people that have good intentions and they come up to me and they pretend they're prophesying. I'm like, dude, please be quiet. That's not even scriptural. Shut up. <laughs> like you're saying a bunch of goofiness. Stop it. You want people that are going to take you back to Jesus, take you back to God's word, and to confront those ideas, to confront that decision so that you are in benefit of seeing a great fruitful thing. Amen? The other one is whose advice will you take? It's not just who I'm going to counsel with, but whose advice am I going to end up taking? Am I going to take up the advice of someone that's going to lead me to the land of trouble and anguish? Or am I going to take the advice of someone who's going to take me to a place of health and healing? That's why Jesus said this. He says, uh, narrow is the way and few go through it. And broad is the way and many go to it. You know what he was talking about? Hell heaven and it's hard to choose the narrow way because think about it all of our junky ideas that we all come up with they don't fit in the narrow if it was a backpack of ideas dang we'd be having like my backpack probably the size of this this screen and I'm trying to go into like trying to get in like no hey you ain't, you, you ain't going in so we have, to, we have to unload our ideas, our theologies, our own belief, and we got to come back to the truth, and then the truth will make us what? Free, and we can go in. Amen? The last one is, who will you turn to? The children of Israel did not turn to God. They turned away from God. They turned away from God's counsel. They turned away from God's advice. They turned away from God's wisdom. They turned away from anything that God had. They turned away from God's plan. We choose whether or not we turn away. Amen? Okay, so let's, let's pause right there. Now, let's talk about this because obviously we know that in these verses that I just broke down, basically God is saying, or Isaiah the prophet was saying, okay, so who will you church, choose, Rahab or Jesus Christ your Lord? And one thing I love about Jesus Christ our Lord is that he will not choose for you. That's what I love about God. Do you realize that? That if you were to call Christianity a religion, Christianity is the only religion that does not have a God who forces anything on you, but gives you the free will of choice. He's the only one. Study, I've studied all of the religions. Christianity, Jesus is the only one that empowers you to make a God choice, but won't make you make a choice. That's amazing. I just think that's just so mind-blowing. And so here in this verse, quickly, John chapter 6, I want to show you how, how Jesus is empowering one of his disciples on a decision that he has to make. Okay, you ready? Okay, John 6, verse 5 and 6 says this. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, so thousands of people were following Jesus for days. They were getting spiritual food, but they weren't getting physical nutrition okay or they were running out of food or they ran out of food just to give you a picture and it says and jesus seeing a great multitude coming toward him he said to philip where shall we buy bread that these may eat but this but this he said to do what 
This he did to what? See, God will present something to you, but he'll test your decision. I said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing. That's the test. I'm setting it before you. You choose. But he gives us the answer, choose life. It's an open book test. It's an open book test. Choose. He's giving you the answer. So he's asking this, this disciple named Philip. He says, hey, hey, Philip, uh, where, where do you think we can buy some bread? There's, there's like a massive amount of people. And he said this to test him for he himself, and I love this part, for he himself, meaning Jesus himself, already knew what he would do. Ooh, that'll preach real good right there. Listen, he asked the question, but Jesus already knew what he can do. The question was, but what are you going to do, Philip? <laughs> Jesus is not, he's not confused about his decision. He's not, he's not like not understanding what's about to take place. Jesus is fully confident in what God the Father can do through him. That's what God wants for us. And so look at this. Let's keep reading. So we know that God always knows what to do. But if we keep reading down, look at this. Uh, there's a young boy. So Philip comes to him. He says, hey, guess what, man? There's this young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with such a huge crowd? This is amazing because think about it. There's, there's, the Bible says there's 5,000 men, not including children and women. That means that if you study the scripture, this says that there was approximately 14,000 people. So when we think America had the first mega church, no, Jesus did. And Philip is like, hey, I'm going to ask a dumb ass question. Dumb ass, okay, don't get crazy on me. And he's like, well, because have you ever had one of those, like, I'm sure you've all said, like, hey, you know what, we're all trying to come up with ideas. Let's just say you're, you know, meeting at work, like, hey, you know. I got this idea, but it may be a stupid idea, right? Have you ever said that? Okay, well, Philip's like, hey, listen, uh, so I got this boy's lunch, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, Jesus, I know you said, uh, where can we go by, but uh, we can't go by anything, but, you know, this little boy, man, he was willing to give up. <laughs> he was willing to decide to give his lunch, and I got, like, two fish and, and, and five pieces of bread, and look what it says, but what good is that with such a huge crowd, it's almost like us. Sometimes we may not have the fullness of the idea or the plan of God, but how many know that, that God can do more with little? Like when you understand, like God, like your idea may be so minute, so small, and you may think it's not even great, but God knows how to turn like small things to great things. And look what he says. He says, okay, tell everyone to sit down, Jesus says. So Jesus is like, okay. You did something. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks to God and distribute, distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. Aren't you glad that God will not waste anything that you give him? <laughs> See, sometimes we, we think that, that our, 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 little will, our little will to make the right decision is not enough to serve God or follow God. Because we think that, well, my life isn't right. Well, I'm not good enough. Well, you don't know what I did last night. You don't, and God's just saying, just bring me that little will and watch what I will do with that little will of yours, of yours that you have. You put that bad boy in my hands, and ooh, let me tell you something. Amen? Listen, a stick in my hand, man, I could beat a piñata. A stick in Moses' hand, he parted the Red Sea. You know what I'm saying? A rock in my hand, probably hurt someone. But a rock in David's hand, he brought down a giant. See, it's the little it's what's in your hand. It's, it's what's in your heart. What are you willing to give up to God? What, are, what ideas are you willing to give up? What ideologies? What, what wrong thinking are you willing to give? Even your wrongest thinking, God says, just give it to me. Let, me. let me show what I can do with it. 
And look, he goes on to say, and so they all ate. And here's my, here's, I love this part. He says, and then they gather, gather leftovers. Aren't you glad that we have a God of leftovers? Like he doesn't just give you what you need. He, man, he gives leftovers. Because leftovers are not meant for you. They're not midnight snacks. Leftovers are the things that we're going to give to the next generation of our, of our family, of our children. It's the next generation. You see, how, the choices you make now will impact the next generation that you have in your family line, your children. And I love this. He says, so they picked up the pieces and they filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves, barley loaves. And when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet. We have been expecting him. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Isn't it amazing that anything that you're willing to give up to God, God can turn into a miracle. Anything that you're willing to give up, anything that you're willing to trust God with, he can multiply it. And not just multiply it, but he can multiply it with leftovers. I started thinking about this as I was studying this, and I thought, man, this miracle wasn't just something Jesus did. This miracle needed cooperation. This miracle needed someone's choice to give up something. Think about it. There was 5,000 men, and out of 5,000 men, a boy rises up, not a man. Well, we see that in today's culture, don't we? A child rises up. Can you, I, and I started thinking like, wow, you know, here's the God. Obviously, this boy was also in the crowd with 5,000 men. He was hearing the same message that the grown men were hearing. He was hearing the same things that everybody was hearing. But this little boy is willing to give up, is willing to make a decision, to make a choice to surrender his lunch bag of food. Not knowing what to expect, but obviously he knew that Jesus can do more with his sack of lunch that he, than, than, than anybody can do with whatever they have. And so we know that Jesus, when you put something in the hands of God, let me tell you something. He will multiply it by 12 times. 12 times. And then I started thinking, like, man, you know, the story doesn't even, like, talk about this boy's name. Like, there's no name. There's no IQ. There's no family line. His mom and dad's name weren't even in the story. You see, it didn't matter to Jesus. Jesus didn't matter what name. Jesus was just looking who will choose to do something, who will choose to let go of, give it all. Who's willing to just give their ideas, give their heart sets, give whatever, to, their pain, their suffering. Who's willing to just give it up? And this kid, he gives it up. And when you think about, you know, two fish, I mean, I know that when we think fish in our culture, we think probably two big tuna fish from like the sea and he blew it up. No, we're talking about like, he probably had like two sardines, you know, and we think of, you know, Lowe's, we think like bolillo, you know what I'm saying? Like bolillo, y'all know what bolillo is, you know, like French bread. And, and no, man, it was just scraps of bread. Think about this. That's why Philip was like, man, what, what can God do with this little? God's like, put it in my hands. I can do a lot with little. And, and we know that he multiplies it. But I started thinking like, man. You know, this kid, this boy was willing to, to surrender his bag of lunch. You see, we have to come to the place where we have the, the courage to surrender our bag of lunch, of ideas, of pain and suffering and wrong thinking and say, God, I'm ready for your will. I'm ready for your advice. God, I need your counsel. Here, take my lunch bag and let God multiply it. But before he multiplies it, you know what he does? He blesses it. God wants to bless what you're willing to give up. What are you holding back right now? Are you holding back prayer time? Are you holding back word time? Are you holding back service? Like, are you holding back your gifts, your talents? What are you holding back? Because this little boy, he gave it all. He wasn't holding back. Are you holding back generosity? Are you holding back forgiveness? Huh? Come on, God's saying, just give it all, put it in my hand, and watch me bless it and multiply it. What are you holding back? What are you holding? You can't hold back. You got to give it all 
to Jesus. Sometimes we hold our pride, right? We hold our anxiety. We hold on to depression. We hold on to fear. We hold on to fear of the future. And we, we think that that little sacrilege, listen, when God wants to do a miracle, the kid was a part of the miracle. So often we want miracles, but we'll do nothing. Another, like I told you, there was many definitions of, of Rahab or Rahab. Another definition of Rahab is called the place of do nothing. Maybe you're in that place right now. You're just sitting there and just allowing yourself to accept the choices you make. And to keep wallowing down to the place called Egypt. God delivered them from bondage. And they went back to the place of bondage. you with this last thought. There was a, uh, a family in the 1900s named the Bordens. They were the richest, the richest family in the Northwest. And they had this young son. And the son hit 21 years old. And these were, these were Christians. They were people that loved God. And he hit that age and he sought God and God, God's advice, God's counsel, God's wisdom. And, and, and the son went to his father and said, Dad, you know, God's called me to, to be a missionary. Mind you, the father was a very, very successful businessman, had a huge company. And this young 21-year-old kid said, I know my call. I'm, 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 I'm called to be a missionary. And the father then gives him his trust which was millions of dollars. It was his trust fund. He's like, all right, okay, well, son, I promised you by this age you would have your, and he got millions, millions. And this young 21-year-old kid, he said, well, he started praying and asking God, okay, God, where are you sending me? And God said, Brazil. And the young man spent all his money, millions, to advance God's kingdom. And throughout the process, as he invested all this money to advance the kingdom, to preach the gospel of Jesus, his father came to him a little later and he said, son, you know what, I'm ready to, to retire and I want to give you everything. I want to give you my business. And I know that if, if you take this business, I know that you're just going to continue to take it further than I have. And I'm giving it everything to you. It's yours. That's not a bad deal, huh? See, some of us would be like, well, let me just do both. Impulse. And he said, Dad, thank you. But, but I'm not called to that. I'm called to the mission. I'm called to take the gospel to Brazil. And that's my call. See, it's difficult when you hear the advice of a lot of people. That's why last week I said, not everything that's good is God. We got to know what is, what is God's, what, is, what does God want for me? Not what's good for you. No, we already done what we think is good for us, and where has that got us? Into a whole lot of trouble and anguish. And so here, and so the kid, he gently tells dad, dad, you know, I, I, I'm going to keep doing what I'm called to do. And the dad was awesome dad. He's like, okay, son. And the kid went. Unfortunately, the kid died by the age of 27. He died of malaria in Brazil. This is a true story. And the father was heartbroken. He was just like devastated of his son's death. And one thing that the kid did is he left a letter. And 
on this letter, he highlighted three things that he wanted his family to know. And it was these, these three simple things. In his letter, he said, I have no reservations. I have no retreat. And I have no regrets. It's rare that you find people that can say, I have no reservations. There is no retreat in me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cowarding back. I've, I have decided I will follow Jesus. I will have no regret of the choice that I made. I'm going to live for this choice that I made. And the father was weeping and weeping and weeping because the son chose to do what God called him to do, not what he wanted to do. And so I'm here to encourage us that though we're not perfect, but that we would put on the mind of Christ and we would say, God, no reservations. No retreat from you and no regret. Because most people live with regret. We don't want to live with regret. We want to live with well done, good, and faithful servant. Would you please stand to your feet? do me the kind favor I want us to extend our hand to heaven and to ask God to help us because right now I know that this room right now is the valley of decisions you're deciding things for your family you're deciding things for your life you're deciding things right now for your future you're deciding right now but remember Jesus said, I have come to give life and give you life to the fullest. Choose life. Jesus, I'm praying, Holy Spirit, you live in us. Help us. We don't want to be in the land of trouble and anguish. We're not trying to go back to Egypt, the place of bondage. Lord, we want to obey you as children of God. Father, I pray that we would choose to honor you, that we would choose to obey you, that we would choose to serve you, Jesus, that we would choose, no matter how much it hurts, to follow you with all of us. Lord, our life is that lunch bag. We place our life in your hand. Bless it in the name of Jesus and multiply it, Father God. Multiply it in ways that we are fulfilled only in you, Jesus. Father, we pray as we lift our hands to you that we realize that that's where we draw our strength from. We don't draw our strength from bondage. We draw our strength from wisdom. We draw our strength in faith. We draw our strength in hope. We draw our strength from love because love not only covers a multitude of sins, but love will cast out all fear. So, Father, as we lift our hands to you, we're saying, help us, Father. We choose you. We choose your counsel. We choose your wisdom. Lead us, guide us, direct us. Father, we will not get off the path. We will stay the course. We will stay focused, Father. We will fulfill everything you've called us to on this earth. Lord, I ask that you would break the bondage of distractions that would literally try to steal, try to waste our life away. No, Lord God. In your hands, nothing is wasted in the name of Jesus.